When Grand Theft Auto V came out in 2013, people fell in love with the game basically instantly. But when it comes to Grand Theft Auto Online, well, it took them forever to just get into the game. I'm still waiting to get in the game. Any time now. After logging in seven years later, the programmer Toast realized it was just as slow as it was on release date. So doing what any normal gamer would do, they took matters into their own hands. Yep, still loading. Gamers are always finding ways to break things. They even made it a competition. Some gamers were able to mod the game to avoid the initial game logos and Rockstar logos. Even though that helped, that wasn't the part that bothered me the most. It was almost always the dreaded screen where you had to be booted into GTA Online after the story mode. Toast timed six minutes to boot up GTA Online. You can get a degree by the time that booted up. This was very common too, as most players were waiting between three to 15 minutes, while some people had to wait up to 15 minutes. I would start cleaning my house if I knew I had to wait that long. We can attribute a lot of things to this type of load time, like computer hardware, networking, how much swag your GTA character has. If your computer is a toaster, let's be real, it's gonna take time to load up intense things. However, Toast was noticing it took six times longer to load up online versus the story mode. Of course, this waves some red flags. Again, GTA Online uses almost all of the assets from the story mode, which is already loaded in anyway. What would cause it to be six times longer to load? Now, if only there was some sort of insanely scientific computing platform that you could see when all of these events were triggered at some, oh, the task manager, <laughs> who would have thought? Opening up the CPU panel, Toast ran Grand Theft Auto V and monitored the results. What they noticed was that during the first minute, it was easy to see what was being used to load in the story mode stuff. However, after that, it was four minutes of mashing out a single core and doing nothing else. It's like the CPU was on fire. Since the graphics card, disk, and network was basically zero, this was setting off some massive red flags. And the kind of red flags that go off when there's bad code in the area. I get the same feeling whenever I look at some of my code. It's worth noting that when you load up a game, a lot of different things are happening. First, your computer could be using your graphics card to render the items easily. Since this is an online game, it could be making lots of network requests to Rockstar servers to get your awesome collectibles. Not every loading screen is the same, but you know something is loading correctly if most of the computer's assets are being used in synchronization. At this stage, it's safe to say that there was a bad bug lurking around some dark side of the code. When it comes to security, one of the most important things that you need to secure is your passwords. And thanks to today's sponsor, Passbolt, they provide an open source password manager for you and your teams. Passbolt has an open source model towards their business that means that the community who develops on it guides the roadmap of the product. Passbolt comes with everything you'd expect in a password manager, like the ability to share passwords with people on your team, user management, multi-factor authentication, browser integrations, and more. It also comes with the ability to detect if your passphrase has been used on hacked websites and has brute force prevention and multi-factor authentication with physical keys. You have the ability to use their cloud edition that removes the hassle of setting it up or you can deploy it to anywhere you usually host servers with native Docker, Ubuntu, Debian, and one-click AWS and DigitalOcean options. Oh, you can also host it on a Raspberry Pi. If you use code CODINGWLEWIS, you can get 20% off Passbolt Cloud and Passbolt Pro. Also, check out their open source repositories as well. Thanks again to Passbolt for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. For programmers, especially in the world of game dev or computer science, CPU profiling is a software that shows the programmer what functions are consuming the most and least percent of CPU time. Programmers use this to better optimize their code, 
If they see something that's slowing down, they'll go to that specific function and see what they can do in order to fix it up or make it faster. In almost all code editors or IDEs, the CPU profiler exists in one way or another, helping programmers squash those pesky little bugs. There is one major issue though. CPU profilers work when working with source code so it can direct you to the point it's taking so long in. What happens if you don't have the source code, however? Toast didn't have the source code or any perfected stack error. It was just four minutes of CPU burning and a dream. In comes another form of software detective skills, stack sampling or CPU sampling. This is really the only option for closed source applications. What you do is take snapshots of what is running at a set time and then create a calling tree so that you can see how long something takes as well as its following functions. I've never gone that deep into software profiling on my channel before, but the author of the blog that I'm basing this video article after used one called Luke Stackwalker, which is really old software. Everything about this software fits the old school programmer aesthetic. The strictly HTML website, the utility only purpose, it just looks fantastic. Since it was closed source, you aren't automatically able to tell what each function is, but they have roughly the same function address. As we can see, there are two bottlenecks, one with 55% and the other at 45%. Let's first discuss what a disassembler does. Follow me. Okay, when you get a closed source video game, business software, or anything, it usually comes to you in a compiled version so that you can't access the source code. A disassembler takes this machine code and converts it into assembly language. Assembly language is still pretty hard to read, but for the case of reverse engineering, it's the perfect tool to dig into the source code. A disassembler is the perfect tool for modders, hackers, or debuggers. After popping open the disassembled code, it was purposely messed up to stop reverse engineering from happening. Oh, DRM. When are companies gonna learn that? You know what? Not this video. Fun fact, while Toast was completely reverse engineering this game, GTA Online was still loading. To avoid this, process dumped was used, which is a command line tool for Windows that dumps memory to the disk for you to analyze. What Toast needed to do was dump the memory while it was being used. After putting the machine code from memory into the disassembly, we finally have some answers. Problem number one. Looking at the disassembled code, we're able to see that at some point it is using the scanf function. Scanf in the C programming language library reads input that you give it. It seems fairly simple, but scanf actually had had some issues in the past. It turns out it is scanning a 10 megabyte JSON file. If you don't know what JSON is, think of it like a big data file, similar to like an Excel spreadsheet or something. This 10 megabyte file contains mostly metadata about your Rockstar account when entering the lobby. However, with the implementation of how ScanF was inserted, it was doing something even more crazy. Imagine 10 megabytes worth of data in memory. Then it moves to the next value. It then counts every single character in the 10 megabyte string for every single read of data it goes by. Then it returns the scan value, just one of them. Now, this isn't 100% accurate, but a 10 megabyte file is nothing for a computer. 10 megabytes is 5 million words. But imagine this. Let's imagine 5 million different values. If you were to read the first value, scan it, then count every single character in the 10 megabyte string, just to return the scan value, it would seem like sort of a waste, right? Well, this was happening recursively with each and individual value. Good to know. Problem two, Toast found right next to number one. So here's how it works. After parsing the item, it stores it into an array. It stores it with an unsigned integer and the item itself. Here's the issue though. Before it stores the item, it checks the entire array one by one to see if the item is in the list or not already. Again, but this doesn't sound bad in hindsight, but it's 63,000 entries long. And it adds up pretty quick. With the quick math, you get close to 2 billion checks. Toast made a little interesting discovery here. Each of these items had a unique hash of some sort, so it would have been easier to use a hash map. Think of it like this. With an array, in order for you to compare the items, you have to go through the beginning to the end to see if it's there. I think we understand already how this can make things complicated. With a hash map, imagine if it was instead stored in a bucket that had 
provide unique attributes affiliated with it to be easier to find. For example, if I was trying to search Lewis, it would be easier to look in the L drawer instead of a gigantic stacks of names unordered. But the truly funny thing is, is that each individual item that was being stored in the array is already unique. It didn't even have to check in the existing array to see if it was unique. So they essentially were just scanning this gigantic array for nothing. Okay, let's go back. Toast found the problem and even found a way to fix it, but now he needs to work on implementing the final solution. The JSON file is something that clearly can't go away, as it is clearly sending information required to make the game function. So instead of stopping that gigantic file from coming, Toast would wait for an extremely long string and cache the start and length of it. If it's called again within the string's range, it would instead just return the cached value. For the second problem, they just remove the checks entirely since all of the values are unique anyway. And what's even better is that all this code is open source for you to check out. So a little throwback, six minutes is how long it took before. When removing the duplication check, it took four minutes and 30 seconds. When it was just the JSON parser patch, two minutes and 50 seconds. With both, it combined to one minute and 50 seconds. That's a 70% load time improvement. Absolutely insane. The article that Toast wrote was written in 2021 and went viral across tech communities online. So much so that Rockstar actually found the post and implemented a patch that fixed it in their system. When tested, similar results were found. Incredible. Even better, Toast was awarded $10,000 for finding this bug. Wow, well deserved. So what can we learn from this example? Well, simple little things can make massive performance improvements. I don't know Rockstar's early intentions, but there probably was a time where they weren't expecting to pipe in 10 megabytes worth of data. Something to note too is how companies like Rockstar are operated as a whole. Rockstar would have for sure understood that this issue was happening, but in order to continue growth, financial incentives, whatever for GTA Online, they would require to fulfill other things that they deemed as a priority. The Grand Theft Auto brand is so strong that waiting six to 15 minutes for GTA Online wasn't stopping growth clearly. The scanf function also calls the string length function, which is something that even Toast didn't see, a clear oversight that was not intentional whatsoever. The fact that a passionate programmer was able to discover this bug using disassembling and inserting hooks is incredible and inspires me to reverse engineer other things. I highly recommend you check out the full article that Toast written. I've linked it in the description below. Also consider donating some money to him as well, as if you played GTA Online, you probably owe it to him anyway. A seriously massive performance improvement. Oh look, we're in now. Thank you so much for watching today's video. What video game do you want me to talk about next? If you like this type of video where I go behind the scenes of all your favorite software and games, I have videos on Discord and how they store millions and billions of messages, how Instagram stores billions of videos, and much more. I also have a newsletter where I send this directly to your inbox called The Better Dev. Make sure you go subscribe. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to be a better dev. Peace out, coders.